Okay, welcome everybody to uh, this evening's uh, Sarah's seminar presentation. Uh, so before I introduce uh, tonight's speaker, uh, just a brief recap on, on the protocol. Uh, so the session is being recorded. Um, so you will have been notified about that through Eventbrite. Uh, so the, uh, the format usually is for the speaker to present for sort of 30 or 40 minutes thereabouts. Uh, and then we uh, open the panel up to uh, the audience uh, for question and answer and uh, discussion. Uh, and as Laura mentioned, if we can ensure that our microphones are turned off as the when the presentation takes place. Uh, so tonight's speaker is uh, Dr. Laura de Olimpio from the University of Birmingham. Uh, she is an associate professor and. Director of Postgraduate Research in the School of Education. Uh, she's also co-founder and co-editor for the Open Access Journal of Philosophy in Schools. And her recent publications are Defending Aesthetic Education, and that's in the British Journal of Educational Studies, and Media and Moral Education, a Philosophy of Critical Engagement, and that's published by Routledge. Uh, so tonight, Laura will be talking around the theme to fear or not to fear, educating the emotions and building resilience to extremism. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, hand over to Laura. Great, thanks so much. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invitation. And um, I'm looking forward to discussing these ideas with you in the dialogue. It's wanting to set the scene a little bit. Um, it's part of a slightly bigger project that uh, myself and a couple of colleagues have been working on. And the sort of overarching theme is this idea of education against extremism. So as you might be aware, in recent years, there has been increased pressure placed on educators to try and solve the problem of radicalised youth. And we can see this in one particular example in the UK, the Counterterrorism and Security Act, which contains the prevent duty. And so schools in England have this legal requirement to have due regard to the need to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. And so schools are charged with firstly identifying and referring to the police children at risk of radicalisation, but also secondly, with providing learning opportunities that build people's resilience to radicalisation. Radicalisation they define as the process by which a person can come to support terrorism and forms of extremism leading to terrorism. And extremism they define in, in the UK government's um, policies as uh, opposition to the fundamental British values. Now, there's been quite a bit of research and debate around this thing um, so far, particularly in the UK context, because of this explicit role for schools and educators. And one thing that we might note straight away is that these two functions of both educating and reporting or referring conflict there's uh you know some some challenges made on on what's being demanded of schools and of teachers but part of this this bigger project is that um we're we're aware of a lot of the criticisms um and particularly around sort of fundamental british values and some of the worries but we wanted to sort of ask whether there was a more constructive or positive role for schools and educators in this space so along with Michael Hand, um, we're guest um, editors of a special issue of educational theory entitled Education Against Extremism, where a number of authors, including ourselves, explore the role for education and educators in helping to prevent radicalisation and extremism. Some of the papers in this special issue that should be coming out soon, we don't have an exact date, but very soon, um, should show that there there is a positive and constructive role that educators can play here. It might include helping children and young people learn to manage their emotions, including feelings of fear. And this is what I'll be talking about um, in this talk today, um, to challenge negative stereotypes by promoting friendship and community, which foster trust and belonging. Um, there might be a role for educators in educating pupils to resist epistemic vices that aid conspiratorial style thinking. Uh, there might be a role for teaching media literacy skills which support critical thinking and there's room for encouraging things like compromise and tolerance which are vital in a multicultural society 
I think there are also a whole range of pedagogies that are going to help to fulfil these aims. Um, and of course, it is questionable whether the, the current specific policies um, that are designed to curtail the threat of extremism in schools, such as fundamental British values, are well suited to such purposes. So there's room for critique there as well. As one of our background research um, that we're, we're drawing upon that we've been quite supported in, in our endeavours, um, Kasim Kassam has published a recent book on extremism where he usefully maps out this concept. And he's exploring it and looking at it in a nuanced way where he doesn't offer just a simple definition or a set of necessary and sufficient conditions. He sees it as a family resemblance concept, which has elements that are ideological, methodological and psychological. And so he focuses very much on this idea of the extremist mindset, which includes beliefs with certain kinds of ideological content, a readiness to resort or incite others to resort to violence. Um, there's epistemic vices and associated preoccupations, emotions, attitudes and thinking styles. So in the special issue, one of the papers by Michael Hand starts with this kind of idea that, well, let's say that Kassam's analysis is, is very good. If, it, if it's correct, then we could look at each of the features of extremism that he identifies and ask, well, what role can education play here? And can schools and educators usefully um, help to prevent or, or work against these kinds of thinking styles and traits and attitudes. And, and then we can sort of go through one one by one. And that, that might be quite a useful project that takes up quite a bit of time. Um, just as, as an aside, uh, we've got Kasim Kassam is, is going to be a keynote speaker for the next uh, annual conference for the Philosophy of Education Society of Great Britain in March in Oxford. So do look out for that. It hasn't been announced yet, so it's top secret. Um, information for you. Uh, so my contribution to this special issue and uh, what I wanted to discuss a bit more detail today is this idea that yes, while educating um, against the radicalisation of students is really, really important and needs to be paid attention to, we're talking there about a small minority, hopefully a very small minority of students. And yet there's something about extremism and the threat of terrorism that affects all of us. And so there is also an important role in teaching the majority, the rest of us, how we might be able to react and respond when we either learn of a terrorist attack or consider the potential risk of violent extremism. And so with regards to this idea of educating the emotions in relation to um, extremism and terrorism, I'm not referring to, just to set aside, I'm not talking about traumatised students who may have been in war turn or experienced this kind of event before. I'm talking about sort of the majority of students who, you know, ha hasn't had any kind of previous trauma, but they might be hearing about the threat of terrorism, you know, either just in society or through media and social media and news outlets. So, among one of the ways I think educators can support this education um, against extremism um, and helping us to look after our sort of emotional responses when we think about the potential threat of a terrorist attack or we learn that a terrorist attack has occurred is to look at educating the emotions. And so in my theory here, I'm drawing upon Patricia Greenspan's distinction between representational and practical rationality, which I'll, I'll talk, talk about each of those in relation to um, terrorism. And claim that our best response, both circumstantially and practically, is to refuse to be terrified. And I'm not talking about refusing to be terrified as a flippant suggestion here. Um, I know I'm going to flesh that out a little bit and then consider what we might be able to do in classes to support this. So by not being overwhelmed by fear or altering our day to day activities, we will better support a well functioning democracy and happiness or flourishing. I also think an additional benefit here is that this kind of response of refusing to be terrified um, is going to disempower rather than empower extremists and I'll briefly say something about that as we go along. So 
what are the best responses we can have then is to uh, refuse to be terrified because if we think about terrorists they're trying to terrify the innocent in order to achieve some other aim or goal um, terrorism then just a definition is a violent act or event um, or the threat of violence against innocent individuals to incite fear or anxiety among a citizenry or to coerce a particular response or action from another person or group of people. Now, because as we know, such instances of violent extremism are usually unpredictable. They, they occur in public spaces. They attack kind of ordinary people doing ordinary things. And so therefore they are deliberately designed to be anxiety inducing in the sense of that could have been me or someone I care about. Um, and so the role that we have then to consider this kind of response of being fearful about something that genuinely is scary uh, has to link to supporting our sense of community and personal well-being. So I'll firstly consider the rationality of fear and under what conditions the fear is a reasonable response to acts of violent extremism or even just hearing about such events and knowing that they are possible. Um, and then I'll consider the educational question about how we can support young people to learn not to be anxious about extremism by managing their emotional responses through the rational education of emotions. Given that we live in a world in which acts of terrorism and extremism, violent extremism can occur and they are genuinely scary, how, how reasonable is it actually to say that we shouldn't be terrified in the face of something that is genuinely scary? So while we can see that um, political scientist Daniel Baldino says, the lesson is, is not to dismiss the threat, and in this case he talks about the just the Islamic State, or those identifying with IS, in a proportionate, carefully calibrated fashion to avoid hyping terror risks and to invest in smart counter radical campaigns. The building of public resilience, the ability of society to restore calm and for citizens to adapt rationally to random events and unexpected changes from terror strikes to shark attacks remains indispensable. So he thinks that not giving in to this sense of fear, anxiety and terror is going to be really important, not just for the individual, but at the level of government, policing and policy. So building public resilience in this way is obviously really, really important, but we're talking about something that is genuinely scary. So how can we manage that fear, let alone educate young people not to, to feel it or not to react or respond to that feeling too much. If fear was completely irrational, then we would have no control over it and then this would be the end of the talk. I wouldn't be able to say much more about it. Um, yet, happily, uh, much contemporary psychological and philosophical research on the topic it is now seeing fear like some other emotions as having a rational or a cognitive component that may be deliberated upon and evaluated by the agent as well as others. So there's got to be some kind of belief component that we're, you know, using as, as a cognitive or representational aspect of what's going on in the world to which we respond. And some of that response is going to be emotional. So obviously as well, there are various kinds of fears. There's everything from anxiety, anguish to warrior, and then all the way up to phobia. Um, but if we look at the definition again, um, there are a few different definitions of, of fear, but they're related to something that is deemed to be fearsome and that we want to avoid. So there's going to be some aspects then to, to, to what we have, we're doing here. We're judging something that actually is fearsome and it may or may not be um, threatening. And then the second part of that is that it's fearsome to us because we want to avoid it. It's important to note that fear plays a vital role in our lives. Obviously, it protects us from a great deal of harm. We don't go walking off cliffs because we look to the edge and we're, we're scared, and that's a good thing. So fear often is really, really practical. It's also, uh, people like Martha Nussbaum would argue, moral. So 
you know, going back all the way back to, you know, David Hume, he's saying that one of the things um, that promotes us to act in moral ways might be for a sense of fear or care or sympathy to another. So if we feel fear for someone, we might be inclined or motivated to step in and, and help them out if they need it. So there can be actually a, a moral aspect here that um, fear is really useful. But of course, we all know as well that we can feel fear towards something that even we don't judge as fearsome. So we might evaluate our own fearful responses and think, oh, that's just silly. I know I'm feeling a little bit scared, but I don't really need to be. It's all fine. Um, so we, we judge the reactions of others and of ourselves and we criticise them when we think they are not warranted. So there's a representational element here where if the object that we're feeling um, scared of is actually fearful, then it's been represented correctly. But, you know, we have this imaginative capacity and if we have um, considered it to be fearful or we're feeling scared and then we realise actually there's nothing really to worry about here, then we might be able to evaluate that representational element as being, you know, a bit blown up or augmented unnecessarily. So we can judge it. So there's We've got to admit then straight away that we notice that there's a, there's a rational element of fear, but there are also irrational and irrational manifestations of fear. Uh, Mother Nussbaum says that fear is uh, both primitive as well as socialised. So there is that aspect of fear that we might jump if we see a snake and that's, you know, rational and makes sense, especially if you're in Australia and they're all going to, you know, bite you and kill you. Um, but then there's also part of this fear that is made a part of the culture or the rhetoric, and we can have a very real reaction to that. Um, fear, again, we should probably uh, be aware of this. We, we've watched enough news. Um, fear can be manipulated. So, you know, politicians, the media, certain narratives and stereotypes can absolutely lead us to have certain kinds of associations and in relation to um, fear of terrorism and of extremists, violent extremism, there's been, you know, a lot of political manoeuvring um, to associate, uh, for example, this kind of fear of radical extremism with um, Islam. And this is where Nussbaum worries about the kind of work that's being done by these narratives. And she also calls um, fear, you know, a vital emotion in our lives protecting us, but it can also be dangerous and narcissistic because it's a dimming preoccupation and intense focus on the self that casts others into darkness. However valuable and indeed essential it is in a genuinely dangerous world, it is itself one of life's great dangers. And so the reason she says this obviously is because as soon as you're very, very scared, you're immediately focusing on protecting yourself and perhaps your your loved ones or people who are viewed as like us and there's a sense of a, a danger of casting everything else into the shadow and othering um, other things so acknowledging that there's um, a physiological underpinning of fear there's also a cognitive element so even if we do have a feeling of fear even if it arises and we might start having our increased heart rate sweaty palms we can still judge the belief that has arisen whether something really is fearful and to a certain aspect to a certain element then we can decide if we're going to act on it by for instance running away so we might jump, we see a stick on the path, we think it's a snake, we feel that adrenaline, um, but if we look twice and we realise it's a stick, not a snake, we don't necessarily have to run very, very fast away from it. You might want to just in case, but we can judge that as being silly. So what we've got then is this distinction between the representational and the practical rationality of emotions, and I'm drawing on Greenspan here. So we can consider whether the emotional response best represents the situation, so if it's fitting, and then we can consider, even if it is fitting, how useful it is. 
So I'm going to argue that our best response, both circumstantially and practically, when we think about the threat of violent extremism or terrorism, is to avoid allowing fear to interfere with our daily lives and actions, or for worry about terrorists to preoccupy our thoughts. So first, representationally. While it makes sense to feel fear about the idea of being unexpectedly and you know undeservedly harmed, and on the desire model, that means we wish to avoid it, I'm going to say that it's unfitting because of the proportionality, the likelihood of actually being harmed in this way by a terrorist attack is extremely, extremely small. So I'm taking the first part of Greenspan's notion of representation here and saying, actually, to a certain extent, fear would represent the appropriate response to the idea of being, you know, blown up in a terrorist attack. However, this is so unlikely that it's not going to be fitting as a response. Um, for instance, we don't stop going to the city and wandering around or driving cars because we are scared of being hit by a car or dying in a car accident. And yet the likelihood of that happening is far higher than of being hurt in a terrorist attack. So our notion of, of what is sort of safe and, and what we should be scared of is, is quite um, out of whack here. So yes, terrorists um, do threaten the safety of individuals um, and, and of property. There's, there's, there's genuinely um, harm to be scared of, but the events of 9-11 remain to this day an extreme and unusual event. For example, it's the only occasion in which more than a few hundred people were killed in a terrorist attack by a non-state actor. So as Michelson points out here, it's important to recognise that conventional forms of violence, such as traditional and civil wars, have almost always been more deadly. The objective significance of terrorism as a threat to safety and individual physical integrity further diminishes when you compare terrorism related fatalities to other kinds of fatalities. So just some examples from the United States, terrorism poses a far less statistical threat to life than most other activities. In 2001, three times as many people in the US died of malnutrition almost 40 times as many people died in car accidents in the same year, not to mention the significant number of people who die in the US every year from gun related violence. Even with the 9-11 attacks included in the count, the number of Americans killed by international terrorism since the late 1960s is about the same number um, as those killed over the same period. Severe allergic peanuts lightning or accident causing deer. So that puts that in perspective there for you. So my first claim then was that that fear is, um, or, you know, not representative because it's not fitting in terms of particularly its proportionality, it's extreme. Even if it was fitting though, is it useful? My second claim is that it's not useful at all. So even if the threat is real, it's actually not useful or prudent to alter our daily behaviours or attitudes in response to the worry about violent extremism. If we decide to stop travelling because cities and airports are targeted by terrorists, this is going to be inconvenient, it's going to deny us pleasure, but it's also going to see terror tactics gaining traction by becoming effective in changing the behaviour and attitudes of everyday folk. So the practical response, what is a useful or practical response? Um, I'm not saying to be completely oblivious, of course. Do be aware, don't be naive. Don't kind of deliberately place yourself in harm's way, but don't be permanently on high alert, viewing all situations and people as suspicious or potential threats. Um, and particularly because what will start to creep in is that uh, those you know, implicit biases, those unconscious biases, um, stereotype um, threats and profiling. And so much more damage is done to our democratic multicultural society. And, you know, especially when we're traveling around the world, if we are sort of having this fear sort of as a lens through which we're viewing the world and guiding our behavior. So it's really, really unuseful. Uh, as, as It's an impractical response to, to have. And so, you know, 
if we're going back to another example, like it, it may make sense to be worried about sharks and I'm not going to just like hurl myself into a shark infested water. Um, but I'm not going to never swim in the ocean just because occasionally someone, especially in Australia, gets bitten by a shark. Do you know like how a lot, lot of my examples of snakes and sharks and deadly creatures do connect to my, the country that I'm from? Um, so what, what I'm saying then is this idea of refusing to be terrified, um, saying calm and reasonable in the face of the threat of violent extremism isn't a flippant or you know throwaway uh, suggestion here. I'm, I, I think it's 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 a very practical and sensible su suggestion, not just because the threat is actually relatively small, but also because the well-functioning democratic society is the most resilient when such threats do not prevent us living our lives and going about our daily routines ideally without marginalising certain groups on the basis of fear-induced harmful stereotypes. Furthermore, the second claim, which um, I don't have you know, much time to sort of elaborate upon, but when we act from a sense of trust rather than fear of others with whom we share our communities, then we're going to include rather than exclude people. And that further disincentivizes those who might actually be vulnerable and at risk of seeking a sense of belonging elsewhere for instance, by joining a group with an extremist ideology. So connecting to the role for educators then, um, I can think of lots of different things that we might be able to do to educate the rational emotions. Um, but this idea of learning to manage emotions, including feelings of fear, and challenging negative stereotypes by promoting friendship and a feeling of community um, and belonging. Uh, I think this is at the heart of, of good educational practice and pedagogy. And I can imagine different activities for different age groups as well. Um, I also think that just as an aside, this idea of educating the rational emotions is really, really important given that we have such high levels of sort of anxiety and depression. And if this can at all help with sort of those feelings of anxiety in relation to other things, maybe that's um, another avenue worth worth exploring and researching. Um, one of the examples that that I use and that I talk about um, is using philosophy for children uh, and the community of inquiry pedagogy to have a dialogical based discussion and sort of bringing in usually starting with sort of a fictional narrative or a story that can be sort of analysed and discussed. And there's, you know, some examples with younger children of even notions of, um, you know, picture books and things like that, where you talk about, you know, promoting inclusion and, uh, you know, not fearing difference and, and not othering and these kinds of things. Um, building up that strong sense of community that promotes feelings of trust that then leads to sort of notions of inclusion rather than exclusion. Um, but one of the uh, things that I think is, is really important is that we we do learn to feel, feel fearful when we react to stories and sensationalised news headings, especially when we log online. So social media and the broadcast news is working on this 24 hour you know, news cycle, and it's constantly trying to promote moral outrage and shock and, you know, awe, but also these sorts of negative emotions that include anxiety and terror. And so there has to be a really important role for developing this critical media literacy and to promote feelings of compassion uh, and sympathy rather than um, fear and, and sort of, you know, which I think we'd have to work quite hard at, given that there's quite a few features of the social media and online platforms that are working against us. Um, it's asking us to have a quick, you know, response and, and an emotional response. And, and I'm sort of saying we need to educate the opposite, to slow down, to think, to challenge and, and question that um, cognitive element, that belief, that representation um, that gives rise to those, you know, feelings. And again, I don't have uh, heaps of time to sort of talk much more about that. But one thing I do write about is, is facilitating a critical as well as compassionate response to others and to stories that we're receiving, particularly online. Um, I call this ethical attitude critical perspectivism. 
and again, one of the examples I use is uh, of sort of practicing this in within the safe space of the classroom and then hoping, you know, that this can work by using media stories within the classroom and, and discussing it in a facilitated fashion with your teacher there. And then you've built up those skills that can be applied online. Um, I've, I'm yet to think more about whether it could actually be facilitated and educated online and you know we've obviously just had a couple of years where we can actually sort of have more ex examples of, of that happening um, but there's still that question of if, if these skills transfer well out into the out into the world beyond that space um, I do like this idea of leaning heavily on narratives in part because if we are talking about things that are scary as long as we're starting in this uh, fictional space there's at least a sense of it being one step removed from the real life events. So you get a chance to, in in the world of narrative and through drama and uh, stories, work with notions of characters and and things that are less threatening to your um, sort of real world uh, existence and and emotions. And you know then then working uh, out how they apply to other stories that are you know received as real or you know through the news and through images and other things like that that are shared so one more example that i have um and i've written uh, about this in, in a chapter that's forthcoming in a, a book on philosophy of education but the idea of using drama in the classroom to work with and um, co-construct narratives that try and counter the extremist vision so one educational expo uh, approach that I uh, researched was anti-extremist theatre and education. Now, interestingly, this was actually commissioned as part of the PREVENT program. Um, and so some uh, experts were you know, bringing this uh, drama education series to different schools, and it's inspired by Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed. But the idea is that you're counting extremist narratives by offering nuanced and attractive alternatives that um, these counter narratives are meant to not just illuminate and critique worrying aspects of the extremist vision and rhetoric and their agenda, but also support this positive conception of a vibrant multicultural community of which all students are part. And so what you see in the anti-extremist theatre and education are co-constructed um, dramatic performances, but then there's accompanied with uh, dialogical pedagogies, classroom activities, there's the engagement with the storytelling, and they very much are connected to the place in which they are created. So it's not just that you get one narrative and, you know, every, every school's putting on this same story. It really has to be, you know, considering the group you're working with and you know their backgrounds and and their their perspectives so they really are inclusive in that way um i obviously just want to highlight that you know this kind of important educational work has to be well funded um you can't just sort of ask the the, the english teacher in a primary school can you just can you just put this on if you don't mind this you know off you go it's, it really is um going to need that relevant expertise uh, to support the meaningful dialogues um, especially when you're talking about themes like racism, tolerance, fear and violent extremism. So um, I'm a big fan of, you know, talking about the effective use of arts education. But uh, I sort of want to point out that I know this isn't just easy and can be just done on, you know, with a bit of cardboard and paper string. So it's like, um, yeah, they need to be well supported and funded when used in this effective way arts education can offer a positive experience and constructive narratives in favour of liberal values that support peaceful and inclusive multicultural society. So there's just a couple of educational and pedagogical suggestions. Um, so I've explored how we might educate people to respond to the news of violent extremism and the worry about terrorists and terrorism in ways that support our sense of community and personal well-being. And not being overwhelmed by fear or altering our daily routines due to the worry about such unpredictable acts of violence, we not only better support a well-functioning democracy and our own happiness or flourishing, 
but hopefully this would also disempower rather than empower uh, extremists. Among the ways in which educators may support such aims, I have defended the pivotal role that they can play in educating the rational emotions. Uh, educating citizens through a rational response to the threat of terror and the actions of violent extremists uh, has to consider the powerful emotions involved when we hear about such incidents that include fear, disgust and anger. But then we can also consider the ways in which these kinds of narratives might be discussed or disseminated through media accompanied by a politically motivated rhetoric that doesn't always seek to unite diverse groups of people within society. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thanks. thanks, Laura. Um, so now um, we're at the point where any colleagues, either you can post questions in the chat function if you if you don't want to um, you know, show your face and speak. Uh, but of course, you're more than welcome to uh, ask questions um, you know, that have arisen uh, based on Laura's presentation. Uh, so I've I've got a few questions, but um, I never like to kind of abuse my position as chair uh, and jump in first. So Jack, uh, ask away. Hi, Laura. Um, that was really interesting, and thank you very much for that presentation. Um, my area of research that I did from, as part of my undergraduate degree, one of my assignments was about the prevent strategy. Um, I was looking at that initially, and I was looking specifically around special educational needs and neurodiversity. What are your thoughts when, you know, for instance, you're talking about these anti-extremism in theatre and th those type of um, programmes? What are your thoughts about neurodiversity facilitation within these programmes and, and, yeah, the development of that and supporting people with special educational needs, particularly as they're more vulnerable and susceptible to radicalisation? not thought about uh, special educational needs provision because that's not my area of expertise I'm afraid to say um did you want to tell me a tiny little bit about it from your research it sounds really interesting yeah I, I, I was just asking because you were talking about this, this type of thing so in terms of that what I found out from from my particular research was about uh, Nikki Riley in particular and I spoke with the psychologist who 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 did the evaluation on Nikki Riley there as well. And um, the prevent strategy was looking at, um, you know, in terms of the neurodiverse element, um, a area, um, you know, creating like easy read documents and things like that to help with the support when it was raised um, and things in alternative formats and, and making information as simple as possible with like a narrative for, for people with neurodiverse conditions. So, yeah, I was I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry. No, obviously, I think that's really important. So mm. I think some of the suggestions you've made are absolutely central. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for that, Jack. Uh, uh, any anybody else? Any others? Uh, any other questions? Uh, Gillian, yeah. Hi, Laura. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering whether you've looked at um, cross curricular approaches to um, dealing with this issue, because it it strikes me that within schools, things that are one-off affairs um, aren't necessarily, well, they don't have the same sustainability. Um, I come from a second language teaching background and one of the things that I've been interested in is intercultural understanding and intercultural competence and I think it, it fits a lot with that. And um, yeah, I just feel that certainly in high schools or secondary schools, Teachers shouldn't be doing it alone. It needs to be a cross curricular approach and it's looking for ways to um, integrate this within different subject areas and then different subject areas talking to one another. Obviously, that's a, you know, a high school approach rather than a primary school approach. But I don't know if that's something that's come up within your own work. Um, thank you. Yes, I 
mostly looked at that sort of not just specifically in relation to this issue, but more generally in relation to teaching philosophy and ethics in schools. And so while I've defended sort of having a class or, you know, adding it to the curriculum, my favourite approach is this idea that it would be brought throughout a whole school approach. And that what that means is that it's that sort of dialogical pedagogy and that space to hear the students' voices and uh, their questions to lead some of the discussion in all of the subjects. And the idea of the community of inquiry where you could have, you know, everyone sitting in an inward facing circle and they're sort of all, you know, this notion of equality and inclusion um, for me was really important because it, it signifies that sense of belonging and builds up that trust. And But I'm also aware of some of the difficulties, like that's the idealised picture, right? And there's people coming in there with very different understandings, backgrounds and, and culture, uh, different levels of understanding and, and, and existing power dynamics. So I'm at the moment writing a, a, a presentation where I'm trying to see if I can answer some of these problems that I'm posing to myself in relation to my sort of favourite answer here, because the benefit of bringing in, I think, the sort of the philosophical thinking skills and the question and the answering is that you are inviting people to ask and answer those questions that are ethical. And they are related to, you know, the world, but can be connected to, to every single subject. And so when these kinds of things come up, they might not just come up in media studies or, or English class, they, they could come up anywhere. And if there's space for actual discussion where it's not just the teacher at the front of the classroom going, oh, let me tell you what, I, you know, <laughs> what the right answer is or what I know about this. It's actually the students being involved in that. Um, then it strikes me that that's where you're most likely to get the kinds of skills practiced that, that I, I want to see help us, you know, to transfer. And I do think it's more needed than ever before because how we see this sort of polarisation and on social media where as soon as someone disagrees with an opinion it's like you can't even have a conversation anymore you actually you know immediately shut it down and so that idea of continuing the dialogue even when you disagree with someone even when your experience is very very different i think it's just needed across so many different you know aspects of having a democratic society but i do think it relates to preventing extremism and and homegrown terrorism by saying to everyone you belong even if there's you know very very different views here there's there's space for everybody and let's try and find a way forward together so obviously idealistic but philosophy and ethics and that kind of dialogical pedagogy was my response to that kind of question Laura I don't know if you know it but I just posted a link in the chat to some work done by Martin Barrett um which is a great resource for different age groups. I have personally haven't used it, but I'm just quite familiar with it. Um, it's just quite interesting. It's a different approach. I just thought I'd post it. Thank you. I'll go have a look at that. That looks great. Oh, do you know what? See, yes, I think I have heard of this. And that's aimed at all different age groups and it, it gives teachers tools um, and various resources. I mean, it's it's a it's a slightly different approach to what you're talking about, but it's just it's another pedagogy with resources and ideas. Yeah, so I'm very much a more the merrier. Uh, I sort of think that I I would rather sort of be inclusive, and if if something is you know something works in this place, and you know something else might work somewhere else, but um, I think yeah, the priority of giving students a chance to have their voices heard, um, you know, in, in that sort of respectful dialogue, listening to each other, sort of trying to interpret what they say charitably and, and you know, build upon it. But also that if there's a space for friendly challenging where it's not just that you go, oh, I think something different to you, so therefore I just won't speak to you. Like actually having enough trust that you can disagree and then still get along with each other and that that's okay i think these are skills that we're, we're just seeming to lose a little bit um or maybe it's the case that online 
we're not being encouraged to draw upon those skills. Face to face, we might be better than we are online. That's really interesting about online and face to face that mm. people now commute, you know, when I was at university, there's no way I would have sent a message online or in a text. I would have knocked on somebody's door. Mm-hmm. And now it's so much easier, you know, or you'd phone someone. And now young people just avoid that conversation because it's just easier to put online. But even in university, that you, we've got adults who are frightened to say what they think. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a biggie, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Could I, could I add something, if, if that's all right, uh, uh, mm-hmm. as well? I think I think it's really interesting that you were talking about the notion of like debate and, and opening up that conversation to make that as inclusive as possible there. Um, you know, when I was doing politics A-level, for instance, as the, you know, as, for instance, when Brexit happened and, and things like that, we talked about that in the classroom and we had that like healthy debate, which was really good. But in terms of this, when we're talking about inclusion as well, I was I was thinking just before is to make sure that, um, you know, as I was saying, the information to be presented as accessible as possible in terms of colour and text and things like that. And that's what I found so far from doing a bit of research with with Craig for my PhD. Um, it's all about making sure that those documents or the discussions are, you know, as accessible to all groups as possible. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Right, I, I've got a question. Um, right, so in, in relation to, uh, you know, the kind of the techniques that you've proposed in relation to um, educational strategies, uh, for want of a better term, uh, and, and building resilience to extremism. So I, I think my question is, to what extent is the potential for these techniques and this and this approach to go beyond kind of terrorism and prevent um you know for example what what, two in my opinion rather distasteful characters spring to mind uh andrew tate who has been you know in the media who is a terrible misogynist uh but also jordan peterson who's who's much more subtle in his approach uh but nevertheless there, there is a there's definitely an attraction with those two characters to attracting uh, disenfranchised males uh, and you know whether it's entering into a kind of semantic sparring with a feminist where Peterson is concerned or um, you know far less subtle where Andrew Tate is concerned you know it's kind of facilitating misogyny um, you know which which isn't necessarily recognized under under prevent uh, but I, I think it should be because it, it really is pernicious uh, and, and kind of, you know, yeah, it's, it's developing quite a lot, I think. Uh, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that you're absolutely right. This idea of the definition of extremism um, is going to include more than just, you know, if we're talking about sort of like, you know, religious extremists. Um, It can include examples of, you know, neo-Nazis. It might include the incels. And certainly in the special issue that uh, Michael and I are guest editing, um, some of the papers are referring to some of those different kinds of extremist thinking and uh, attitudes. So some of them don't refer to, you know, sort of homegrown terrorism at all. Uh, And the, the contributors come from different countries as well. So we've got uh, people from, um, well, we've got Australia, we've got Britain, uh, we've got the Netherlands, we've got US, Canada, um, and I think it's, um, you know, Pakistan as well. So we've got these different perspectives where in different places, the form of um, extremism that they're most preoccupied with or that educators are most preoccupied with might be slightly different as well. Um, Mm -hmm. My wider interest, I think, connects to you answering your question more specifically, is in, you know, sort of educating for epistemic and moral virtues and avoiding epistemic and moral vices. And so these kinds of habits of thinking that are going to be reasonable, inclusive, tolerant and respectful, um, for me, they're just going to be really important as sort of a democratic citizen, as just anyone, you know, trying to live a good life. 
And of course, it's going to be most important for those people who aren't inclined that way. And so um, a ways of, you know, building them in. That's why I sort of talk about philosophy in, in the schools as a all school approach, because it's like, well, whatever subject we're doing, we want to be critical, but we want to be asking the, you know, not just the we can do this, but should we, the moral question, um, how do we engage with, with this critically that's also respectful? Um, I think, you know, those sorts of uh, habits are going to be useful, uh, you know, across not just all the different subject areas, but then, you know, in life. Um, and I, I don't know exactly why there is such an appeal, as you say, for these disenfranchised, in, in this case, it's, you know, men um, who are very much being attracted to this idea of, it is a very black and white way of thinking and a narrative where, you know, they've been victimised and so now they're going to rise up as the heroes of their own story. And so when I'm talking about sort of offering these more attractive counter narratives, the biggest objection to my answer is, well, actually a nuanced, fleshed out, subtle um, narrative is not going to be as appealing to these people as something that is so simple, black and white, where they are the hero of their own story. That's that's going to be, you know, how is that going to compete with that story? Uh, and I haven't. I haven't quite got, you know, an answer to that yet. Um, obviously, we can't rely on education to do absolutely everything. We need other parts of society to help and say, you know, what are the kinds of values we're promoting? And if we've got sports people and um, famous people doing really well when all they value is, you know, using things for their own purposes and, and you know, being rich and famous, then we're going to be failing. We need we need better role models as well. So I think we can do one bit of it, but, you know, we need to sort of find a way to promote those narratives and voices that are more inclusive and virtuous rather than less. Right. Yeah, I think in relation to that, I agree with you. I do think that education, you know, is a potentially a powerful um, uh, antidote to those developments. Um, but it's interesting because I'm also interested in the work of uh, Augusto Boal and the theatre of the oppressed, who kind of who takes, you know, Paulo Freire's notion of the pedagogy of the oppressed and applies it to the notion of drama and performance. Uh, and I think, as you say, implementing those kind of role play situations where, where young people and children can kind of act out not only kind of different positionalities but also the implications uh of, of being treated in a certain way and, and you know and in, in a sense and trying to enter into the mindset of somebody that has been uh treated um inappropriately so so i do think that's quite powerful yeah I think the the only the so I'm I'm going to kind of carry on with my stream of consciousness because that also links into the other question that I had in relation to um, sort of wider uh, familial and kind of societal pressures as well. You know, so 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 whilst it is the case that we can <clears throat> you know try to develop strategies and techniques within education, uh, it, it is still quite a kind of isolated context you know when considered in relation to family and wider family and community um yeah so have, have you any thoughts on how to I, you know that's quite an impossible kind of question and, and and solution but any thoughts on how um how how those wider pressures might also be tackled as part of this well not from my own personal experience but i do know um in the philosophy in schools, some of the research that's been done there, I've got a collaborator who's over in Haifa in Israel, um, and he's got some PhD students who are doing some really interesting work where they're bringing the community of inquiry into the homes of, of families and conducting sort of these discussions with families. Um, and it's in a sort of a very interesting um, space over there with, with very much a sort of uh, division um, and, and different perspectives and things like that and um, just I think he was just very well not just him but the researchers he was working with were very aware that just doing something in the class not only wasn't enough 
but it could create a problem for the student if you give them these different perspectives and then they take them back into the home where there's just one perspective that actually it's quite um, difficult for that student then to move between these two very different spaces. And so, uh, you know, starting to bring the dialogues back into the community in those different ways, I thought was really fascinating. And as I said, I haven't um, done that in that way myself, but um, I also am a big advocate for public philosophy. And again, just bringing those dialogues. I, I, I mean, I did run these uh, philosophy cafes in the community and sort of, you know, doing role modeling of, of dialogues through, through radio programs and things like that. I just think, as, again, as I said, the more the merrier approaches that we can do, the better to just encourage dialogue that is respectful and inclusive and just not shutting down the conversation as, as much as possible. And obviously there are limits to tolerance. You know, there's going to be some things where we're like, OK, that's that's not allowed. But um, just to get better at, at, at having uh, conversations. And if you've seen philosophy Twitter uh, recently, that you know, philosophers are meant to be really good at this and, and they're not. <laughs> there's, you know, there's still this, uh, you know, this kind of um, heat, this heat in the in the arguments. So, yeah. Oh, that, that's some great and, examples and, and there. Yeah. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're, we're down to the last last few minutes. So, are there any other questions or comments? Um, yep, yeah, Michael. So, I just I just jumped on when Laura started talking about narratives because I I do have this worry that we're never going to come up with a liberal narrative that's anywhere near as sexy or as compelling as a fundamentalist religious or an extreme right wing narrative, which are defined by their kind of simplicity and purity of vision. And the liberalism is just messy and contradictory. And it's, it's about sort of tolerating difference. And I, I, I just feel it's, it's, it's probably a non-starter to try and come up with a counter narrative. I, I think what we need to do is wean people off the idea that they need <laughs> narratives, that they need kind of compelling stories that make sense of everything, because that's what's dangerous. That's, that's I, I, and in a way, I think Kasam, Kasim Kasam is just on the wrong track insofar as that's what he's recommending as the solution. So I think as educators, we have to problematize and messy, messy up the picture rather than try and offer some alternative narrative. But I think that's what the government are, are, are attracted to. The whole British narrative, British values thing is all about a kind of narrative of Britishness, which will somehow compete with the extremist narratives. But I think it's a non-starter. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with you. And it, and it is kind of, uh, you know, in relation to the British government <clears throat> and in particular the Home Secretary, uh, it's really distasteful to see the way that this this simplified <clears throat> narrative is kind of hijacked and used as a, a ideological, yeah, you know, a crude ideological tool to attack certain people. Uh, but but as you say, therein lies the attraction for some people that it is mm. it's a very simple story, and so therefore that's the solution that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, it kind of. It's, it's that kind of almost a hegemonic process where, where, where when people feel isolated and removed from any power of con and control over their lives, so therefore they resort to a powerful narrative in order to get in order to make sense of things. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I agree with you. It's uh, that's not the way to go. <laughs> Um, it just reminds, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in, but it just reminded me of some work that I'm, some theoretical models that I'm using for some other work about, because you were talking about, Laura, epistemic vices and epistemic something, I couldn't remember what it was, but um, I, I'm doing quite a lot of work on, believe it or not, student teachers' views of research, but I'm using models of epistemic beliefs and looking at epistemic emotions um, and epistemic emotions can be positive or negative when you've got the alignment or misalignment of beliefs and then something else coming at it. Does that make sense? Am I being straightforward enough? So basically, if you've got congruence or incongruence with your belief, you can have either a positive epistemic emotion or a negative one. And and what was quite interesting in a paper that I've been looking at, and it's for, it's for another field entirely, but I think it's related, is thinking about buffers to help 
to get some alignment because we've talked about the fact that you know if you are for a counter narrative then it meets with opposition and then actually you're causing more trouble than you, you start with so it's like what do we as educators do to buffer pedagogically that alignment that misalignment and, and how do we do it anyway it's just a model that I'm working with at the moment I just thought actually it, it kind of works here does that make sense yeah. I don't know. I've I've sort of brought in something quite theoretical, but I've tried to do it simply and quickly. Don't know. That's, that's interesting. I mean, I guess um, yeah, we'd probably need some examples to yeah, yeah of course, make more sense of it. But yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, um, time time has gotten the better of us. So uh, uh, the hour uh, is upon us. So uh, some really great questions and uh, discussions. Um, yeah, in general conversation there. So I, I would like to thank Laura for the presentation and for fielding those questions and for you know presenting some really interesting ideas uh, and techniques for us to kind of think about uh, as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.